Hey, what's up guys? Welcome to another video. My name is Dylan and I'm a cycling coach at Carmichael Training Systems. Today, I'm gonna to show you how to get the most out of your power meter by doing a quick analysis of one of my training rides to show you what to look for after you're done riding. I'll go over some Training Peaks basics and how to interpret your power data so it isn't just squiggly lines and numbers on a screen. Thanks for joining, and if you're new to this channel, I make training topic videos going over tricks and tips that I've learned in my 12 years of training and racing experience that have gotten me to the top of the ultra endurance mountain bike game and as a CTS coach. I also go into the science on your training questions, so if you want to learn how to get faster or more about sports science in general, be sure to subscribe to this channel, and if you have a training question, leave it in the comment section down below, and I'll either answer it down there or do some more research and make a whole video about it. So you've got yourself a power meter, but you don't really know what to do with the data. It just looks like numbers on a screen to you, and when you look at your ride afterwards, you don't really know where to start. If this describes you, then stick around because I'm about to analyze one of my rides to show you what I look for. First things first, if you don't have a Training Peaks account, you should definitely get one. For those of you who don't know, Training Peaks is an online training tool where you can upload and analyze your ride data, and it has a lot of cool features that go beyond just using Strava. I'll leave the link to Training Peaks in the description below. The ride that I'll be analyzing today was a six hour endurance paced group ride with the Asheville Winter Bike League with a 13 minute hard effort thrown in to test the legs after being dormant in the off season. I started off this ride by riding 18 miles out to the Asheville Winter Bike League and what we noticed by looking at these first 18 miles is how steady they are compared to the rest of the ride. This is pretty typical when riding on flat roads by yourself versus riding with a group. But how can we tell that the ride out was more steady than when I was in the group, other than just looking at the spikes in the power line? Well, we can take a look at the variability index, which is an indication of how smooth your power output was. The closer the variability index is to one, the more consistent your power output was. This is because the variability index is determined by dividing your normalized power by your average power. For those of you who don't know, normalized power is an estimate of how hard you would have gone had your power been consistent. Normalized power takes into account variability, while average power is just that, it's the average power that you did on the ride. So if we take a look at a segment from when I was riding out to the group ride solo on flat roads, we can see that the variability index is 1.01, which is extremely consistent. This is because my normalized power was 214 watts, and my average power was extremely close at 212 watts. However, if we take a segment from when I was riding in the group, my normalized power was still 214 watts, however, my average power was 167 watts, giving me a variability index of 1.27. The reason for this difference is because the group was surging more up hills and around corners, and I was also coasting more like when I was drafting someone on a downhill. Theoretically, these two efforts should have had the same physiological cost since they had the same normalized power, However, they were obtained differently. Usually the first thing I look at when analyzing a ride is the normalized power, the average power, and the variability index. And you can use this to tune your workouts to be more specific to the races that you have coming up. If you're training for a time trial, for example, you wanna be doing efforts with a variability index as close as possible to one because time trials are very steady efforts. However, if you're training for something more punchy like crits, for example, then you want to have a much higher variability index on your training rides. The next thing I look at is the efforts I did on the ride. If it was an interval session or there's a specific part of the ride that I know I went really hard on, I can highlight and take a closer look at it. In the case of this ride, it was the hard 13 minute climb that came two thirds of the way through the ride that the group decided to race up. The climb lasted 13 minutes and we can see that my normalized power is 360 watts and my average power is 350 watts. In the case of this climb, the pace actually picked up in the last five minutes towards the top of the climb, and if we scroll down to our peak power values from this ride, we can see that I had a peak five minute power value of 394 watts. If you want, you can compare these peak power values to previous year's peak power values to determine your progress over time. The next thing I look at is IF and TSS, and if you have no idea what those acronyms mean, don't worry, I'll explain, but first I wanna make it clear that these numbers are only accurate and useful if you have your FTP set right in Training Peaks. 
you can set your FTP by clicking on your face icon, scrolling down to zones, and then scrolling down to power and plugging in your FTP. If you don't know your FTP or even what FTP is in general, then be sure to check out my video on five ways to test your FTP. I'll leave the link in the description below. Now back to IF and TSS. Your IF tells you how intense the ride was by dividing your normalized power for the ride by your FTP number. If you rode at your FTP, your IF would be one. If you rode higher than your FTP, your IF would be over one. And if you rode below your FTP, your IF would be below one. For this ride, I had an IF of 0.67, which basically means that I rode at a normalized power that's 67% of my FTP. This is pretty standard for a long endurance ride and for shorter, more intense rides, they'll have a higher IF because those rides are more intense. This is where we can really start to make sense of power numbers because IF is relative to you and your ability. 220 watts might not mean a whole lot, but 67% of my functional threshold power gives me a much better idea of how hard I went during this ride. Of course, the intensity is only one part of the equation in determining how taxing the ride was, and the other variable is duration. This is where TSS or training stress score comes into play. TSS takes into account both the intensity factor and the duration of the ride. My TSS for this ride was 277, which is pretty high for an individual workout, but makes sense since the duration was so long. I also could have gotten the same TSS in less time if I had ridden harder. In this way, TSS is a true representation of how taxing the ride was that goes beyond just counting hours. Also, since TSS is based off your IF, which is based off of your personal FTP, your TSS is unique to you. Somebody who did the same ride as me, who rode at the same power, could have a different TSS number if their FTP is higher or lower than mine. Another thing to look at would be time spent in zones. Since this ride was an endurance ride for me, I want to make sure that I spent most of the time in zone 2, which we can see that I did. I also like to look at work done in kilojoules. This is another way of determining how taxing the ride was, but to put it in terms that most people understand, work done in kilojoules is roughly equivalent to calories burned. This is because even though one calorie is equivalent to a little over four kilojoules, the body is only 20 to 25% efficient on the bike, so work done in kilojoules is roughly the same as calories burned. All that being said, kilojoules is a good way of determining your fueling needs on the bike and after you're done riding. So that's what I usually look at when I'm analyzing my ride data. To recap, I first look at the normalized power and average power and how they relate to each other through the variability index, which gives me an indication of how smooth and consistent the power was on that ride. I then look at any hard efforts or intervals I did up close and also the intensity and how taxing the ride was through intensity factor and training stress score. Finally, I'll look at my time spent in zones to make sure I was in the zone that I intended for that workout and my work done in kilojoules to give me an idea of how taxing the ride was and my fueling needs. Notice how I didn't say anything about average speed, pace, or time on certain segments. This is because in terms of training, your speed doesn't mean a whole lot. In rare circumstances, like when I make a bike modification and I want to see if it's faster, or if I'm trying to improve my mountain bike downhill skills, I might look at time on a certain segment, but for 99.9% .9 of the time, I'm just looking at power. Remember that your average speed is affected by climbing, wind, road or trail surface conditions, and a host of other factors making speed an unreliable training metric. If you guys want to learn more about training with power, I'd recommend the book Training and Racing with a Power Meter by Hunter Allen and Andrew Coggin. When I first started learning about how to train with power, this book was a huge help to me and most of what I know about training with power today, I learned through reading this book. I'll leave the link for the book in the description below, so be sure to check that out if you're interested. I hope that you guys found this information helpful, and if you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, share it with a friend, and subscribe for more training tips. If you want to see more training content, be sure to follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And if you want to follow my personal training leading into the season, be sure to check me out on Strava. Finally, if you're looking for a coach, shoot me an email at djohnson at trainright.com.